We're really excited to talk with you and share with you some of our experiences and ideas on how to approach uh, the millennial learner, especially from the perspective of the digital. And so today I have with me two of my esteemed colleagues. Um, I am Bridget Maher. I teach in the Film and Media Arts Division and School of Communication. I teach a lot of the um, digital classes. I also am program director for the Digital Media Certificate Program. So this uh, topic area is near and dear to my heart. Um, to my left, I have Professor Lena Jaswal, who leads and is head of the photography uh, concentration in Film and Media Arts. And she will be telling us about um, how millennial learners approach uh, their material and um, to my far left we have Professor Christian Perry who teaches our advanced animation and digital classes and so he'll be talking to you about some of our approaches. Our objective today is to paint to you the landscape of some um, things to think about when approaching um, teaching digitally to our millennial learners and then just some case, case study examples of how to approach and so um, many of you may not be um, coming from a perspective where you teach um, skills-based classes. And so what we hope from sharing with you our experiences is that you can extrapolate and think about how you can apply some of these more general approaches to your own work. So with that, I will then hand it off to um, my one of my two better thirds, uh, Professor Lena Jaswell. So I am going to um, talk about photography, but I'm actually going to, so one of the things that I think for the people who aren't um, teaching photography is that you can use photography in every class that, or your project or anything. So just take what I'm saying um, and apply it to the projects that you could give into your own classes with the sciences or any of that sort of stuff. And um, I'm going to first begin talking a little bit about millennials. And so I, uh, we'll get to uh, some of the, you know, sort of the meat stuff in a little bit. But really, teaching, um, teaching photography has changed significantly since the advent of digital photography, obviously, right? Well, now we're facing challenges, though, to how do we teach to students that have never not known the internet? or not had cell phones or laptops or these kinds of um, materials to them. How do we teach photography to a generation that uploads millions of photographs to Instagram and Facebook on a daily basis? Right. Um, so how do we teach them principles of photography, especially since people come in saying that they know so much about it already because they're experts because they have it um, uh, right on their phone. Um, and you know they have immediate access. So these are some of the things that we're gonna, we're gonna talk about. And to our students, you know, because you have a high level of comfort with these technologies, does that mean that you actually understand them? So these are some of the key things that we're going to do. So from selfies to Instagram to film, I'm going to talk a little bit about how photography has changed teaching to the newest generation. Um, and one of the things I think is the most important aspect of this is that we've moved from a teaching-centered environment to a learning-centered environment. And that is, uh, I think, the key. That's the shift that I've seen in the last 20 years that I've been teaching here. We shift as being the knowledge providers to really being the people that are the source of inspiration. So some of the characteristics. Now, I want to preface this as saying that these are characteristics. They do not apply to the whole general audience. So you know, everything that we want, that I'm going to go over, it applies to an overview, and it's not. It's certainly like some people in this classroom. I can I know because you've been my students. Don't follow all of these traits. So let me just speci specify that. So m millennials are multitaskers. They're diverse. They're group oriented. They're collaborative. They value peer opinions. They're confident. They value lifestyle above work, which I think is a key generation from um, from our genera generation. Xers to the new generation. Um, but these are, but again, we have to remember that this is a diverse group. And so they come from, they're racially diverse, they're ethnically diverse, they're um, culturally diverse. So there is a lot of other elements that add to this. So we've got to keep that in mind. But one thing about this generation that I act actually really appreciate is they tend to be a little bit more tolerant than the previous generation of all of these things. So I think that's kind of nice. Um, but again, we want to keep in mind that not everybody fits into this neat box. 
that we're putting them into and that most of or a lot of the studies on millennials have been based on same type of student bodies that they see at and so they're very small you know it's a small representative based on this on um, similar student bodies um, millennials are knowledge makers so we read in one of my classes every semester we read about Su with Susan Sontag who's a media cultural theorist uh, who was, sorry, a media cultural theorist. And she, um, she talks about how photography promotes a relationship with the world that creates knowledge. And one of the things that she goes into is that how powerful photography is, but it's the reflection about photography that is needed for a deeper learning. Uh, so we'll talk about kind of, um, you know, here are the technical things, but really what I think is the most important thing as a teacher that I've changed in the 20 years that I've been teaching here is I've moved away from being so technical and very specific, but actually bringing in more of the critical analysis and the critical thinking skills into the classroom where before I might farm that out to readings but now I'm having the students come in and talk about these things in the classroom and letting them go to some of the lynda.coms and and figuring out their or googling the technical aspects where they can get the information somewhere else so this notion of structure the second point on here is that um, for the most part this group of students live very structured lives well, they, they've come in with like parents that have scheduled them to do this, this, and this, and this, and this, right? And the nice thing about photography is that it can introduce spontaneity. They have access on their phone at all the times, so they're able to kind of, you know, wave, you know, say, okay, I've got this, this is great, here it is, I'm gonna photograph it right there. It also helps to empower um, the student to immortalize these moments that they, that they have. They're multitaskers, and I think at this point all of us are probably multitaskers, so I don't know if this is just really related just to the millennial um, generation, but it also means that they're distracted easier. So we talk about, I mean, we had a, a, a great robust conversation about laptops, the use of laptops in the classroom and um, on our SOC listserv about whether or not it's good or bad. And one of the things that we see is that they might be paying attention to what you're doing, but they also might be checking their um, social networks and stuff at the same time. So they're multitasking. So not all of that is good, okay? Um, one of the things I do in my syllabus is that I establish sort of weekly presentations or goals so that they know that these are things that they have to get done during this time period. Um, I also am a big fan of a variety of assignments and, and some students probably don't like that because they feel like they have to do something every week but I feel like if they change if I change up the assignments they're not getting bored with 50 percent written on just one paper that they have multiple ways of learning and they get multiple grades so I think that to me is a really effective way of doing that. Um, my students in the room are going to uh, laugh at this, but um, I think that they, hopefully they don't get bored, but for straight lecturing, my classes are four hour classes. So there is no way that we can stay for four hours. There are, there's like one class period I know that we lecture for the entire four hours, but outside of that, I try to break it up into it to uh, presentations from the students, break time, lecture, lab, et cetera, so that they get a break every 20 minutes or so and we try to change it around and do something, something a little bit different. Great thing about um, of photography that works with this generation is that they want instant feedback. So we can look at a digital image and we can um, say, go back, try this again. I think that we really need to allow them to, to work on trial and error. Right? There's not, if you work on just one assignment throughout the whole semester, there's not a lot of time for you to go back and revisit and think and come back. So with digital photography, it's been really great. We can go back and say, this doesn't work. Go back and reshoot, try this again. It allows for them to make mistakes, which they really haven't had um, the ability to, to do. The instant gratification sort of comes from the practice. Um, you know, these students grew up with baby boomer parents who were praising every little thing. I do the same with my kids, so I don't know how he's gonna turn out, but you know, like you pick up a glass of milk and you're like, that's a great job, you know? And so this generation has, is used to that. And so every little accomplish, accomplishment comes, comes to that. One of the great things about that, it leads to confidence. Right? And I think that is a, a, a thing that, a trait that I see from the millennials that I actually really, really enjoy. Sometimes a student will walk in with a know-it-all attitude, but we all, we've always had that. So, you know, we sort of let that go. Um, but I think one of the things that's great is that if somebody makes a valuable contribution to the class, they want to know about it. 
So we'll go back and like if we talk about an image during critique, three weeks later I'll bring that up again and say, hey, remember so-and-so's image that we talked about? This is, what, this, is what this, uh, this is the lighting style or this is what we're looking at. Um, so we get these ideas of sharing images and getting immediate response. One other thing that, I, that I've noticed that, that in trends of changing is that students really like to have assignments, like really rigid you know, things to think about. They, they, when we give them the broad topics, they don't know where to go. So help figure out, give them topics or questions that they can try to solve and answer and they can gather the information with. Um, again, this group is pretty diverse and group oriented. You know, photography is like, I think it's the best thing about filmmaking. Like, you know, the film, when you get together with filmmakers, you have to work with the team. But um, photography you can do on your own, but still have the environment of being with other people. So, um, so it helps them connect. Um, one of the things about this generation is they know everything about social media because they're living it, they're experiencing it, that's how they get information, that's how they share information. So they value participatory culture and you have to get on board with that and the digital connectedness. They value peer opinion, even so more so than your opinion as the professor in the room, right? So, um, so this, is, this is where they kind of get their information. Now, one thing that is really different, the lifestyle versus work. Unlike previous generations, this generation is going to go through many jobs. According to the, United, uh, the US Department of Labor, one out of four current workers have been in their job for less than a year. One out of two have been there for less than five years. And it's predicted that today's students are gonna have 10 to 14 jobs in their lifetime. Right? This is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics in 2008. I've been teaching here for 20 years. This will probably, I'm a, a tenured professor now, this is probably where I will be for the rest of my life. That is like one major job, right? So these are changes that we're seeing and shift, shifts that we'll see in the, with the millennial generation. So some other things, the need to feel special. Photography helps render a small slice of life in a very specific lens through that individual, right? Um, it allows a photographer to share only their viewpoint. Because it's so, uh, uh, it's so immediate, it's an attainable goal. They can see it immediately. It helps promote groups that we talked about a little bit before. Um, but one of the other things that I had said, like you know, taking the critical thinking skills and applying them into the class, farming out a little bit of the, the technical. So we get into really great discussions. We read Susan Sontag, we read Martha Rossler. We talk about you know, the things that are interesting to the students. They're interested in, in human rights issues. They're interested in the environment. They want to be, they're civic minded, right? So that we need to bring these things into, how, uh, into our classroom and then how photography applies to that. So we talk about the notions of predator versus tourist when you're taking a photograph. We talk about um, the inequities of social documentary and how that maybe is used to keep the status quo. Um, and we talk about different political thoughts throughout the time. So this is just a sort of a breakdown of the top uh, photo sharing sites, which I think you might be really interested in. Um, there's this false kind of set of, um, uh, a false sense of competency that, that this generation is media savvy. Just because they've had access and they've had hands-on experience doesn't mean that they've got their heads on experience, right? Um, just because millennials are self-taught does not mean that they're taught well. So we get that all the time when somebody comes in and says, look at my beautiful portfolio, and they have no idea how the, the, like really the nuances of how to get, how to get there. So here are just some, some numbers. So when people ask me, like, should I major in communication? So that, what can I do in visual communication? I tell them, these are the numbers. You know, how are the first, what's the first way that you're going to actually do research? Are you going, would you rather look at a video or look at an image? Or would you read a 20 page paper? So the power of media is really important and you can kind of see just from these numbers of like how, how important it is. Um, one of the things that when I first started teaching Photoshop over a decade ago was that I was very tool centered. So, you know, every class we would go over each of these tools and like explore them to, to the minute. And now I, I, like I said, I'll still go over that stuff, but I farm it out at, to the lynda.coms, the tutorials, and then I, um, it, it allows us to talk about the ethics, the history, the, all of the other sort of stuff that is actually the more critical thinking skills. 
so one of the things that I wanted to share was actually my Facebook group. And uh, a second, I don't think we can, so I'll just scroll through here. So um, I created a Facebook group for each of my classes. And this to me is really actually very interesting. So my class was done on January 4th. And I want to show you, or uh, sorry, not January 4th, on December 4th. For the last month, how many posts the graduate students have done beyond the classroom? They are sharing information like crazy. This is like continued our class. Like I said, our last class was December 4th. And you can see by just scrolling over and over and over again how into this they got. And this is not their, their major. Their major is filmmaking. And you can just see. Um, and it's not me providing the content. I will go in and I'll write some things here and there, but it's the students that are valuing this, um, which I think is really great. If you aren't using some form of social media in your classroom, the students are gonna think you're irrelevant. So this is the way that they communicate, okay? Um, we've had, through this time, they, they actually share their, their outtakes. Like, here's ones, the images that, that didn't make it to the final critique, what do you think? So they're continuing the class well beyond my learning with them, or my teaching with them. Um, and so I just think it's really great. Another thing that is that uh, I saw that I didn't, um, that, uh, sorry, oops. Oops. Sorry, let me scroll up. There we go. Oh, whoops. Skip. Go back. Another thing that I saw um, with this group is that they actually, um, they'll photograph the notes that I write on the lecture board with their phones or their iPads. This is totally new. This happened the first, first time this semester. And then they share it on the Facebook site right before the quizzes. So everybody has a refresher of their exams. They could easily type them up and disseminate them some other way, but this is, what they, this is, this is sort of how they choose to do it, which I think is really nice. One of the things about the Facebook site that I like is that it gives them direct access. You are teaching 24 hours. They can, they can access that site well after class is done, any time of the, um, of the day. So I think it helps to create a sense of community. We, um, we've created a private teaching space, which is, I think, really exciting. And we can, I can interact with them as a group, as a cohort, rather than just on an individual basis. Um, so the other thing that we've started to do is tailor assignments to things that are interesting to them. So selfies, like we take this notion of the selfie. Um, this, genera this generation has taken to selfies more than any other. The Pew Research Center survey found that 55% of millennials had posted a selfie on some social media site. Overall, 26% of Americans have shared a selfie, and only about 6 out of 10 uh, baby boomers, or about a third of the silent generation, even know what a selfie is. Selfies have become, uh, they, they were declared the word of the year by the Oxford Dictionary in 2013. So we're taking things that mean something to them. And Instagram, there's 35 million selfies to date on Instagram, right? So this, these are important numbers. So we tailor the assignments to them. We talk about what it means about representation. We, um, we do a self-portrait assignment, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, but we also talk about and remind them that, you know, Norman Rockwell did this in 1960. This is nothing new. So we can talk about the, the context of all of these things. Um, this is one of the graduate students from last semester who did this really meta self selfie. So he photographed the image on film, um, holding the camera like this, then developed it, and then did another self, uh, selfie with holding his fingers, shooting the digital camera over here. Just thought it was a, a great example. And then I know we're talking about everything coming digital, but really, I've seen an, uh, um, a real rise of interest back to film because it is something new to the students and it allows them actually to get away from technology, which they sometimes really feel they need the break. They can't um, bring their cell phones into the labs because it'll expose the film and expose the paper. So for four hours when they're working, they're without their electronics, which really gives them a chance to concentrate on what, what they're doing. But in my fine arts class, and this is the last thing that I'll end on, in my fine arts class, we actually, the class is sort of billed as how to teach you how to use Instagram filters for real. So we do both um, show them all the alternative processes on how to get the filters, both in Photoshop 
and the analog processes. And we talk about how that can be really effective. This is a um, really well-known photographer, Richard Moss, who um, used old infrared film and shot the um, DRC. And he's a foreign correspondent, he's a journalist. And so we talk about like how, it, if this was not done with this process, how does that change it? It could just be like regular everyday images, but because he's applied these things and these things that we've talked about, um, it makes the images stand out more. So I would just encourage you to think about photography and how you can apply it into all of, uh, apply it into all of your classes. It doesn't have to be a photo class that you're teaching, but you can take some of these skills and uh, really make a nice site based on what your, um, your topic area is. And adopting some of the techniques of millennials, I was multitasking and listening to Lena's great presentation and then taking my own um, notes in terms of what I can apply to it. Okay, oh, are we gonna switch places? Okay. Although I'm still a little bit analog with my notes here, so. Whereas I guess millennials would really be uh, looking at their phone. Okay. Um, so what I wanted to talk about um, in my segment of the presentation was just showing some case examples from um, one of the classes that I teach. So I tend to teach um, the digital uh, post-production classes in the film and media arts, and then as I also mentioned earlier, I also teach the graduate um, digital media certificate program. Um, so I work with both undergrad and grad. With the uh, certificate program, it's really unique because I'm working with adult learners who are completely unfamiliar. So I'm working with um, any, you know, baby boomers, Gen Y, and then we always actually get, or excuse me, baby boomers, Gen X, and then we get a little bit of the Gen Y in there, which I actually think um, spices the whole dynamic up. Um, but for the context of this presentation, I'm actually going to talk about 18, 19 year olds. So um, in terms of how to think about digital manipulation with students who grow up with manipulation, grow up with this idea of well, what really is real, right? The simulacrum, which is something that is a philosophical question that we, we ask as ac academics, but is something that kind of inherent in their, in their makeup. So specifically, these examples from, come from a course, COM 250, which is possibly the second course that our film and media, or the third course that our film and media art students um, can take. So they take a visual literacy course, and then they can start to take other courses. And so often, um, they may take it simultaneous with basic photography, or they can take it before basic photography or after. Um, basically, first years who are um, in spring, um, spring semester first years typically take it, or sophomores. In this case, um, when I taught it last spring, it was almost entirely made up of first years, except for one senior who was trying to get a requirement out of the way. Um, so, one of the things that I feel is really critical is although I am a huge supporter of taking the tech out of the classroom, I think that you can't take it entirely out of the classroom because then you lack context. So what I do within a face-to-face -face environment is actually not too dissimilar to what I do when I approach um, an online environment. So in this particular case, imagine week one, you go over the syllabus, you talk about expectations, you try to kind of scare them a little bit into taking your course seriously. Um, you go, you provide them with an, uh, an overview of what you're covering for the course and then you give them some reading assignments. That's typically what I do. And then we meet back week two and we get into the nitty gritty. Well, what I want them to think about is um, social and ethical responsibility of what they create as makers. Because we're primarily thinking about makers, but you can apply this in terms of if you're, if you're training um, theorists as well. So, you know, I talk about, let's look at example of O.J. Simpson's mugshot and what are the implications depending on how you manipulate the image. And Professor Jaswell and I were talking about, you know, then there's also, there's multi-layers. There's the image itself and what that can imply as well as the image with the textual references and what that can apply. And then I show them how it can happen, how they can do it, which is then taking the technique and the technical aspect. They can learn about the little bits and bobs and the, you know, the buttons and everything like that outside the classroom. But, but how they actually get to this point where they can make the decision of how they want to represent a person is critical. So I take this example of um, this little girl. And this is an example of a little girl angelically sleeping. Um, the original image has um, basically jam all over her face. And she's just asleep. And you know the, the color correction is off. It's just a basic snapshot of admittedly my child, okay? But what I end up doing with them is I show them the technique and the technical but button pushing by showing them how to create an angelic 
version of this child and also a version of this child who can be dead or sick. I know, it's a little bit disturbing, but by <laughs> having them go through this exercise of like, look, you have the responsibility. You can make this, this image look as if this child is beautiful, but you can also make this image look as if this child is dead. That suddenly fills them with a lot of responsibility, which then helps to shape the rest of the course. And I think that also knowing that these millennials are very civically minded, I, they really welcome this notion of responsibility and that they can basically direct their own um, learning in a sense. Because again, I'm no longer a lecturer, I'm a even though I'm lecturing to you, but we will have questions and answers. We're facilitators. That's what we are in terms of our roles with these millennials. And it really opens up critical analysis into, I think, um, professors and students who aren't within creatively based classes can often think like we're button pushers or that skills based and that's not the case. It's just the context in which we wrap critical studies. We wrap it within the context of skills. So then another aspect of millennials is that they have a lot of pressure on them to apply what they're learning to the ultimate end goal of getting a job. They're hearing it constantly from their parents. American University is really expensive. If you're gonna study film, if you're gonna study art, if you're gonna get study photography, then you better be able to walk out of here with a job that can make your loan payment. Um, so I don't quite get into the artistic aspect. So I've, I've, they have a responsibility. They have an ethical responsibility for what they represent. And then I give them an opportunity of this is how you can be, this is how you can make a living with it. So the last example that I showed you was week two. So they, they know what they're getting into with the class. Week two, they realize the responsibility that they have as makers, and they've actually learned how to do it. Week three, they're realizing the commercial implications for what they create, and at the same time recognizing that images are representations, whether it's a manipulation that happens in camera or a manipulation that happens in post. So in this case, this is Annie Leibovitz, and she did a Disney Resort campaign a couple of years ago. This is um, Jessica Chastain, and so she is Merida um, from the animated film Brave, and you can see that what a complete construction photography is. Okay, so they understand it from a commercial aspect that the skills that they're learning have direct applicability to the world that they're going into professionally. Um, at the same time, they understand this notion of representation because on one hand, they want to know that every single thing that they're learning has a direct commercial and professional application, even though at the end of the day, for first years, we're training liberal arts learners, right? Because chances are that our undergraduates may not directly use film and media arts, but they may use it as just one of the tools in their liberal arts toolbox. Um, so after we show and walk through these, um, the artistic and design aspects of these images, I make it a selfie, right? Because we need to bring it back and make it about them. Um, it's also a really practical way of getting them to, um, out of their, getting them to be device focused, but in a way that's, that um, you as a facilitator has, have control of. Because most of the time you have students and you know, they're kind of listening to you, and I mean, we can all relate to, they're like this, right? They're trying to hide it from us, but the fact is is that they're looking at their device. So if you get them constantly to use the tools that they're gonna be distracted by for your own good, for your own purposes, it makes it very difficult for them to use it for any other purposes. So I always make the tools that they're gonna procrastinate on or digress on part of what we're doing. So they make it a selfie. They take a selfie of themselves, they email it to themselves, they turn around and they actually, and this is week three, right? They're not quite at any Leibowitz you know, technique yet, but it gets them thinking about, I want to be there. It motivates them like, oh, I, I just created this. I actually am starting to get a hang of this. I could create it by the end of the semester and I assure them, actually, you will have the skills by the end of the semester if you work hard and do your homework. <laughs> um, so I think that, you know, again, bringing it back to relevancy and focus for them at the same time, driving home the commercial aspect. But then, in terms of liberal arts education, we wanna show them the artistic and creative aspects of the tools that they're learning, and this is something that's the most difficult for them, which is why I ease into it. Responsibility they get, okay? Commercial application they need, Creativity is what we really need to instill upon them, 
whether we are teaching them a, a course you know, in CAS, SIS, SPA, they need to have critical thinking skills, and those critical thinking skills are um, partially derived by creativity, okay? The ability to feel free to think. So this is where, similar to Professor Jaswell, I really try to get them out of the digital realm and make them recognize that not everything has to be digitally constructed and that you can work in a hybrid analog and digital environment. Um, and this was greatly facilitated as a call out to our new McKinley building because prior to this, um, you know, we just didn't have the space, but now we have actually a space to be creative, which I think is also part of the environment, you know, to be conscious of how do you set up the space every day when you're teaching a class so that you can basically attune yourselves to how millennials like to work. So, you know, I brought, I brought um, markers in and one of, their as one of the aspects of teaching them about color and design and art was to have them actually recreate Wassily Kandinsky's concentric circles. So 10 years ago, I would have lectured about Kandinsky's concentric circles. I would have shown some slides. Some of you may have experienced those slides and talked through color theory by Kandinsky and I would have worked in Johan Itten and the metaphysical properties of color. Um, and I would then bring into a cultural context of color, etc. Well, I do all of that while they're coloring now because they can multitask and they actually listen better when they are multitasking than if I was just lecturing to them. So again, make the multitasking, make these characteristics of who they are work for you in terms of the learning process. So they're sitting there coloring and I'm talking, and I still show Kandinsky's concentric circles, right? Don't get me wrong, but I do it while they're actually engaging. So they look up and they can start to apply their own creativity, but they have a model, so they're not left out on the lifeboat by themselves. They can still, they're close to the big ship, right? So then they create the concentric circles they take a photo of it, and so you can see here, they're coloring, then they're taking a photo, and then they're emailing it to themselves, again, making that device work for you, and then they pull it up onto the computer, and then they actually, I teach them some technical aspects in terms of how to manipulate the colors that we were just discussing in terms of color theory, um, and we go from, we go from there. So, um, and then of course, thinking about, thinking about Facebook and ref self-reflexivity is such a big aspect of uh, millennial learners, you know, as um, one of these students wrote, that is so meta, it's a, you know, somebody creating a panorama of working on a panorama. Our millennials love to have um, the opportunity to do these kind of exercises. Um, and what I have found really effective with, with Facebook um, is the opportunity to have immediate feedback as Professor Jaswell said. I have experimented with using it for discussion-based forms and find it really, really clunky. Nobody can backtrack, nobody can find out where other posts are. It's not designed for that. Um, but it's, what it's really good at is if you have a question about something, you get immediate feedback because everybody's already on it. And you can also kind of trace their emotional um, and psychological um, relationship with the class based on, on whether they post, whether they don't post. Um, which is also really effective in terms of getting to know your students. Um, and then I actually make um, social media part of the exercise. So here's moon phases. That's actually um, a design for a new app so that you can track the moon phases um, on your own phone. So I, I have them actually, this is when we get into a particular thing called flat graphics or vector-based graphics. So I teach them about how to create vector-based graphics, but by first actually having them propose an app that they think is a, applicable and marketable. So again, bringing it back to commercial, tying the aesthetic technical skills to something that's relevant outside of, outside of their field, um, and then continuing a discussion, um, discussion via, via social media. Um, so these are just a couple of examples to think about. I'm just going to hand it off to um, Christian, and then we'll have a little bit of time afterwards to answer, answer questions and brainstorm a little bit. Well, these are all excellent things that I will crib myself. Yes, this is right there behind the Prezi. There you go. I think it's also notable that we're all doing Prezi's because we know that millennials hate PowerPoint, right? How many of us enjoy using Prezi? Yeah, the millennials. <laughs> I mean, I think that that's the, that's the catch is that, that millennials are really derived by Prezi, so we've had to be more visually focused in how we present information. Quite right. All right. Uh, 
So I'm going to talk about, uh, I think we've had an excellent background in a variety of things. And uh, as I said, I'm going to be uh, stealing some of these things I hadn't heard before from my class. Uh, I'm going to talk about primarily what the folks in my talks to me about is uh, motion graphics to millennials. But uh, it's going to be about how we're going to take what could fall into a completely technical, practical course make sure that there's a theoretical uh, aesthetic underpinning so bring those together so that we get a, a richer learning experience and then also how we're going to uh, actually practically instantiate that in class keep people engaged so so the difficulty is is that we in this class we're working with after effects there is a very steep learning curve the software is in the way stands between the student and the creativity. It's tedious, it's daunting, and when dealing with millennials, it's not just, you know, I said so, this is a class, that's not a sufficient motivation. We need to teach them why they should bother. Because all I really want to do is tell stories. The people who come to my class want to tell stories. So this is what we're going to learn. They live in a very rich and diverse e media ecosystem. You've got high art and low art. You've got uh, amateur and professional, uh, independent and large studios. And the divisions between these uh, distribution methods and production methods are blurred, and it's not obvious. So you have to recognize that. And these are the examples. These are the things that are going to be inspiring. I will show a little bit of this. Here's an idea. Maybe some of us think of video games as being about their mechanics. This is PBS Visual Studios, a what YouTube channel. Is how learning the mechanics of a game and getting better at it can possibly work against the storytelling of that game. True, certain games like Freeze, Chess, Checkers, and Go are almost pure mechanics. Uh, experimental animator David O'Reilly. Intentionally uh, low polygon, sort of that kind of thing. Uh, intentionally humorous and strange. Uh, a fan made Walking Dead trailer. And the kids love this. That's very uh, patronizing. My students love this. I love this. <laughs> so, anyway, you get the idea. So, in my research and in practical, my, my experience, how do I? get this going? How do I get people motivated to climb this very steep hill of After Effects? Uh, I frame it in terms of empowerment. I make it personal. I tell them my story, that when I took the class, uh, it was a, a liberating experience. I learned that I could make any story that I wanted, that I could imagine. It was all inside this magic little box. And so after uh, some awkward silence, when I've told them my personal story and overshared, uh, I think they're start, the, the lights are starting to come on. But still, I've told them they can do anything, but then in their minds, they're thinking, this is one semester, the last animation I saw was a Pixar film, or some new anime on Netflix, is that even plausible in one semester? And the answer is, likely not. But there's so much more to animation. They, there's more to it than that. And so I have to explode those myths. Where do we start? I will typically start with a brief history of animation. It is, the history of animation is rich with different aesthetics, different techniques of delivering emotion and narrative, and uh, so many different practical physical techniques that were used. All those practical physical techniques are now inside a little box that's easy to purchase and use. There's probably a plug-in for it usually. So anyway, we don't need a history of animation per se, but Anyway, we'll skip that. So, as I mentioned before, we've got the theory and the aesthetics. So how do I bring that in? I've been talking about empowerment. I've been talking about the technique. What I do is we have them read a, a simple and accessible uh, essay by animator David O'Reilly, Basic Animation Aesthetics. His main point, easily digestible, is that since you could put anything on the screen, don't, uh, don't, don't succumb to the danger of putting everything on the screen. The world is made coherent and engaging and believable by a consistent set of laws that you impose on your world, whether it's 
photorealistic dancing animals or stick figures or shapes. It has to be consistent and internally consistent. Those laws allow for uh, vis visitor and you know, viewer engagement. So we read a simple essay. Now, we actually get to the pushing of the buttons, making the machine go. We have to do that. So in my class, I share with them, uh, a, we start with the Google Drive that I've shared with them. This is just the practicality of it. There's a one-to-many uh, read-only folder where I can provide students uh, reading materials and exercises that they can download as starting points for their work. There's also individual Google Drive folders that are shared one-to-one -one with my students where they can upload their individual work and I can critique it and review it. So I begin them downloading today's lesson and then I start doing a demonstration of the technique. In this case, it would be a, a lesson in masking, revealing and concealing using simple tools. And I go through all the little buttons and levers and pulleys to make it go. And they're watching on the big screen. They've seen me do it once. By now, they've downloaded to the day's exercises. And I have them go to part two of the lesson. They're going to do something themselves. I've given them some basic raw elements, and I'm going to have them wrestle with the technique. In this case, I have them build the famous James Bond opening sequence. There's a little hole where you can see James Bond. And now, down comes the blood. My students love blood every semester. <laughs> the quietest, most prim, <laughs> respectable looking people love gore, they love blood. It's really, it's instructive, I don't know. So, they've got that, they recognize that that is a cool thing to do. They all agree that it is cool, and they start working on it. So, I go through the class as they wrestle with it, and I give hints or make explanations, so like, oh, you're, you're pushing the button wrong, Here, here's how you do it. Sometimes it's like, well, you're pushing the button right, but this is the better way to do it. In any case, they've made something cool. They've struggled with it. It's now in their minds, in their muscle memory, and that's why you bother with this technique. Okay, so this practical lesson. Now we come back to the theory. Every week, they come back with a rough cut or a fine cut of a previous assignment. They do something creative on their own using the techniques we've talked about. So we've read the uh, David O'Reilly essay, Basic Animation Aesthetics. How, is, how do you make a coherent world? Whatever it is at any level of sophistication or simplicity. We then, entire class, participate in in-class critique. That's a technique I learned from a professor of mine. And uh, we, uh, everyone is engaged in the theory, and everyone sees it instantiated in real life. They understand the real application, the concrete meaning of the theory, whether it works or doesn't work. Finally, we've got some theory, we've got the technique, and now I show them something that is inspiring. Uh, in the case of simple shapes and masks, I show them, uh, oh, oh, that's sad. Anyway, it was a really excellent video of uh, uh, an alternate uh, opening sequence for the show Dexter, using simple shapes, simple motions, using the masking technique we had learned previously in class. It's sexy, it's slick, and it's fun. And I'm saying, you've learned this technique. Now you can do this. You just simply have to be thoughtful and creative and work. And that should be both daunting and challenging, but inspiring. And typically it is. In conclusion, our students are eager to make things. They are impatient to make things. So you have to show them that's possible. Remove the aesthetic and psychological barriers by giving them a framework, giving them inspiration, and you know, showing them the world that's possible remove the technical barriers, how to make the machine go. And then let them on their way. They're now challenged by their own creativity. And that's what they have to do. So. Great. Thank you, Christian. I think that that's really helpful in terms of digital or um, millennials who, if something doesn't come easily to them, then they're more apt to, to quit. And so that's a great framework for how to keep them motivated. We purposely wanted to leave 15 minutes um, so that there could be questions, answers, discussions, brainstorms. Um, so that's the stage that we'll be at. And then Jill, after. Hi, uh, Ron Martinez. I teach college writing. Um, I've been using Facebook groups as a way of sharing um, research sources, encouraging students to post from YouTube videos to scholarly articles. It works really, really well. I, I enjoy it. Um, I'm encountering some Facebook fatigue from people. And 
I've now had students asking me if we can't have a class blog instead for either privacy reasons or they're not, they've deactivated yeah. their Facebook, they're tired of it, they put privacy concerns. Then I worry about too many platforms. They're checking Blackboard to see assignments, they're checking their email to see announcements from me, they're checking their Facebook page, and then they're like, where is that? And they start to, mine explode a little bit. So any comments about that, I would love. And then I have a question, if anybody has a suggestion, um, I love the idea of, of visual arguments. I have my students looking at advertisements. Do any of you have more suggestions about sort of iconic visuals that you love that, that definitely take, make an argument? And or do you have an essay to recommend about truth in the age of photoshopping? I'd love to share that to undergird my, um, my visuals. So one of the things that I do, because the, the Facebook group is optional, so it's not a mandatory thing. You know, they still know that they're going to get the course content information through the Blackboard site and through the email. Um, most, I think I had all but one student sign up for the Facebook group in this last, this last semester. And I sort of make that more of their space rather than like classroom space. And so that's why they, if you've noticed my example, they took it on, you know, they really took ownership of it. And they were, they posted things that, that we might have talked about in class, but that they went beyond. And then they started finding their own things. And so the Facebook group was, is a totally optional thing. I don't grade them on participation or anything from that, it's just an extra place for them to have resources and share. So I found that to be um, the best way to do it because like you said, there is, there's definitely a pushback. There's a lot of people, including myself, who've often thought like, should I really be on this? This is just eating up more time. Um, but, but this semester really surprised me how active the, the grad students said, you, you know, they were on, on, on the group. Cause it, well, it hadn't been that successful, but this makes me want to do it again and again. Oh, okay. yeah. 18, 19, 20. Yes. Um, there was a great exhibition in 1995 at the Philadelphia Museum called Photography After Photography, and it's all about manipulation. It's all computer based um, stuff, and I think there's some really great articles written about that um, from that. And I know I had the library order the book, the catalog, so I know that it's in the library, but that's one source if you're looking for other images about um, there's this. Uh, German photographer who inserts himself in news historic photos. So it's sort of like, where's Waldo? But you see him and that, but that changes the context of how, um, of how we view news photos. Like you'll see the, the famous Kent State picture and then he'll be in the background somewhere, you know, or, um, you, and, and, and we, we can talk about that and how it challenges um, the notions of authenticity of what we see. Um, there's a, an artist that I love that my class is probably the students in my class who know are going to be like, ah, but Sherry Levine, she's a photographer who just re-photographs other people's work and doesn't change. I mean, she'll say that she's adding glares or there's a, cha there's a shift in the light of how she photographs it. But what she's actually doing, her, her works are all called after Sherry Levine or after Man Ray, after um, Degas, like, you know, after the after series. And what she's asserting is that by seeing her name, Sherry Levine, doing this after series, is that she's recognizing the lack of women representation in art by these canonized male artists. So that is that like we could spend hours talking about Sherry Levine because the students get really enraged, and then others get like so excited by what she's doing. So those are just a couple things that I would suggest. Do you have other? I can talk about multiple platforms from the perspective of working with first years and then also actually adult, adult learners. Um, both adult learners because they're learning this material for the first time and also first years because they desperately need a lot of structure because their whole lives up until this point have been structured. Um, what I focus on a lot is redundancy and structure. So um, I actually do make, um, unless they sh demonstrate like a real need for not wanting to be on Facebook, I actually have the Facebook group as mandatory. Um, but um, I make sure that how I structure Blackboard is that it's as redundant as possible. So you can go anywhere in Blackboard and be able to find the material. Um, because that's important because so many of my classes is teaching new media, which means that they have to go outside of Blackboard to find what they need anyway. And with Facebook, in terms of participation, if I want to get engagement from some of the quieter students, 
you know, participation is now effort, and they can use Facebook as just one of the places where they can carry out discussion. So I really make an opportunity for them to engage in the material. They can engage online, offline, in the class, and so I don't make it, I make it mandatory in that, like they can be on there, but it's optional in terms of how much they wanna participate. But for the quieter students, you know, we do have online and in-person personas now that are ampli um, amplified by, by social media. So you can have somebody who's like really, really quiet in class, but all over Facebook. Um, and so it gives them an opportunity where to participate in a way that they wouldn't have had before. So those are just my two ads for that. Jill, you had your hand up? Yes, yeah, so I had a question. Of course, Lena always gets me wildly excited. Thanks, Lena, for waking me up just in case I wasn't there. My name's Joe Klein. I'm from Kogod. Um, and I um, use a fair amount of technology in teaching a general education class. But one of the questions that I have for all of you is that whether it's Facebook or Twitter or even the Blackboard um, social capabilities, how do you create um, sort of grammar barriers or parameters so that the students know that you are not a 24-7 social person? Um, what, what is it that you do to sort of help create boundaries and also expectations on how you're going to respond to that student. That, that's an interesting thing. It, for me, anyway, it's a challenge. They're like, well, why aren't you up at 3.30 <laughs> responding to me? You know, one of the I, things. I don't really want to give them my sleep. No, one of the things I actually tell them is that, you know, I also give them my cell phone number because we're at the very beginning, they're doing such technical stuff that I don't want them to wait a week to meet me because then they're going to be two weeks behind. So I, I tell them, call me anytime until the hours of 11 o'clock. And I said, if my phone goes off and wakes up my kid, you're in trouble. Like, I'm not going to like you, you know? <laughs> like, um, so I, I tell them, you know, up until 11 is going to be okay to email me to, to do that. If not, you'll have to wait for your response after 11. So I set that guideline already, um, you know, and the very first day of class. And, uh, and, and they're really good about, you know, sort of adhering to it. And if they ask about immediate response, you know, well, why hasn't she like gotten back to me my email, I will politely reply to them that I have another group of students and, you know, my own work commitments and stuff. And they get it. I think they're, for the most part, they understand that you're not going to, to respond. And what was the second part of your well, it was thing about how you create the boundaries around all of this social? So the social other, the the one other thing that I think is really important, and I'm doing it, this is the first, it took me a semester to kind of construct this, but in my syllabus, I'm having an inclusivity diversity statement saying that this, in this class, these are core concepts that we will be talking about, we will be getting into this, and everybody needs to respect each other. And you know, so it's like, a, it's a paragraph, just like we would use in, you know, for um, the Writing Center or any, any of the other things that I'm including in, and that kind of is going to set the tone of how we treat each other in the class, and how, how I, what I expect from them, and what, um, and if we're not adhering to that, that, that they can come speak to me or CDI. So I think that might be a shift that might be interesting to create some, you know, that they're not posting crazy, crazy racist things and et cetera, or misogynistic things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, for me, uh, I, 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 I just sort of inform them that I will respond as soon as I am and that I have work and private commitments and no one has thought to challenge me on that. Uh, and, uh, but I, I, or when I'm leaving, I, I, one of my class, I teach an evening class, we get done nearly at 11 p.m. and someone will say, hey professor, can I, can we talk about X, Y, or Z as we're gearing up to go home at the end of the class? And I will say, I am not going to remember what you're saying so I will need you to email me and then email me your question, else it will disappear, and I will respond. And just, I, I say, this is how I will communicate, and, this is, and, and it's all very friendly, and everyone gets it. And, and if someone does write me at three and they don't get a response immediately, they will learn the life skill of disappointment management. <laughs> 
You know, in terms of how I approach it, and it's different depending on the digital media, depending on graduate students versus undergrads. With the digital media class, it's um, adult learners. It's an eight-week intensive online class. They have work commitments, which are paramount. They have family, which is paramount. So if they don't get an answer to their question, that can completely derail them. So this is a terrible like first part of the answer. For the eight weeks that I teach the course, I don't have any boundaries. But I know that by the end of the eight weeks, I'm done with them. You know, very politely, I enjoy them. I create a <laughs> great environment. But it's like I just pretty much set up for myself that I'm going to be at their beck and call for eight weeks because they because they're different. They're a different group. It's like your PMBA program. It's just a different group of group of learners, and they respect and they. I, I notice that because you make yourself completely um, boundaryless in terms of being accessible, then they actually, because they're mature grown-ups, they put the boundaries on themselves. So it's never been, they really only reach out to me if they're really in trouble, but then they're appreciative that I'm there for them. So that's how I approach that, and it's like eight intensive weeks for me, it's eight intense weeks for them. In terms of um, first years or undergraduates, first of all, I, you know, I just really, I put it into the syllabus, I literally say, I will respond to you within 12 to 24 hours or 24 to 48 hours, which means that they can't keep emailing me if they haven't gotten an answer back because it hasn't been 24 hours yet. So I'm very, very specific um, on that. Um, I also incentivize um, peer to peer um, uh, responses and participation and that's where Facebook or whatever social media platform you want to use can be really beneficial so if you answer another peers question you get extra credit or it counts towards effort that saves me a lot of trouble because mm -hmm. somebody will post a question about something like you know when is the assignment due date well of course it's on the syllabus and a blackboard but never mind mm -hmm. when's that assignment due you know, another peer, oh, I want to show that I'm engaged, will respond to that. Or if there's a question about how, how did you do this, and they'll paste. So I incentivize the participation on one of these platforms, which I find really beneficial. And then I just need to go in and look at the, look at the, you know, kind of thread, and then either correct or, set, or like. Sometimes it's as simple as like, somebody says something that's correct, and I like it, and I'm done. Um, so being really clear on boundaries in terms of syllabus. And then, you know, I find that this particular group of students tends to, because they're so rule-based, be more, and I may be wrong, maybe they're more respectful than my own generation of Gen Xers in a certain way in terms of how they approach you because they've had such a strict learning environment. Whereas when I was, you know, a Gen Xer teaching Gen Xers, there was, I had much more issues in terms of boundaries of like, that is not a polite way to refer to me or anyone. So that's another kind of added advantage of this generation. So that's my two cents. Um, any additional thoughts or questions? I don't know if I'm the only instructor feeling this way, but sometimes there's a pressure to catch up. Um, my students bombard me with all the stuff they've come up with troweling the net. And you know, I'm really focused on my core concepts for my course, and so time after time, with, you know, don't you know about this? And, you know, this is happening. And I'm like, no, I don't. And so I'm trying to put a finger on which stuff I need to at least be familiar with to have a dialogue with them. And I just feel pressure to catch up and live more like they do, uh, hmm. constantly, you know, digesting all this uh, kind of various uh, stuff from places that I've never been. Um, and I, and I have to figure out what's relevant and what's not and uh, which things are most important. So I feel like pressure to catch up sometimes. I know, I teach emerging new media. So it's, it's, it's uh, I feel the same way. It's like, am I supposed to be somehow the knowledge base for all things new, which is impossible. So I kind of have detached myself from that. It's like, I know that I have, I am, um, there's a certain specific set of knowledge that I am the expert in and that anything else that you bring around this knowledge helps me to help you facilitate your knowledge base. But I kind of let go a couple years ago from knowing you know, what the latest, um, oh gosh, what's that, that um, there's a dating thing that I learned about last semester which made me feel really old where you, you can't, are you left or right? Yik yak, yeah. was that the thing that I showed you? The oh, yik -yak? there's yik yak, but yeah. then there's, um, what's the other one? There's Tinder. 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 Right. Yeah. God, that made me feel old and married. I mean, it's like there's, certain, there's just certain things that I just detach from and just say, but these are the core principles that are driving this particular, um, you know, 
platform or this particular, you know, these are the critical issues that may be driving this, this kind of conversation. I just keep going back to that. And I also, and this is more of a um, kind of approach, uh, interpersonal approach where um, I am really open to these ideas and these things that students bring in and I don't try to be the master of everything because if you try to be on top of things and you're not, they really pick up on that. So, so I'm just like, wow, I, 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 I know that I know not. Right, I just go back to like, the Socratic method of like, wow, I had no idea that existed. That is really great. How does this, and then you tie in the critical yeah. issue, which demonstrates your relevancy of why they're in the classroom with you, and then I pull it home. But that's the approach that I've learned in teaching a platform or a teaching a space that's constantly shifting. I would turn it around on them and yeah. have them present, you know, say, oh, I just learned this new thing from so-and-so. I'm going to use Nate because he's right here and he's one of my former students. Nate, why don't you tell the class about this discovery and then say, you know, how does this go back to one of the processes that we talked about in class? So then you can take some notes and if it's like, oh, this is just a cool widget, then you're like, maybe I don't need to spend all my time looking at it. But if this really relates to like I had one, a, a student who um, we talked a lot about representation, about women representation in photography, and she found and we read some dated 70s article about representation on women and she found an up a recent take on this about instagram and sent it to me and said this ties into our class like this and so i was like this i have to rem like this is an updated ver so that to me was like trigger i have to read this because this is really important but just have turn it around on them have them explain why it's relevant to the course uh, or what they've you know and it allows, again, to, to reinforce one of the points that I was making of recognizing them and having them be sort of like, hey, look what a great job that Nate did and, rep and bringing that up. Yeah. yeah, I do that a lot too. It's really yeah. effective. It brings it back to them. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. We appreciate it. Feel free to talk to